welcome back to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about failed states. So many failed states in so many places. What makes them fail? Our guest for this show is our geopolitical analyst, Rupmati Khandakar. Welcome to the show, Rupmati. Hello, Ajay. Thank you for having me on your show, and I love being here. You know, the thing about failed states is, you know, we we really haven't paid attention. We we use the broad brush of global south. Maybe we're supposed to be referring to failed states in the global south or weak states or fragile states. It depends on how you define. Um, but uh, let's begin with the definition of what is a failed state. How does a failed state get to be a failed state? What's it like living in a failed state? Can you help us with that? Okay. There's a failed state index uh, that comes up. Uh, and so when we hear this term as failed state, in international politics, this notion is of uh, of those states which have a government which cannot provide for them uh, any kind of governance, political, economic, social, and other type of stability within the territory that they govern. So, Jay, we see so many instances of this happening. So what really categorizes uh, these states into the um, notion of a failed state is, is the discussion of our topic. And I assure you, it's vast and it's interesting. And there are so many aspects to it that we we fail to give a, um, what do you say, integrated look at, Jay. And that's what makes this topic uh, so um, uh, heavily defined. And like you said, the Global South, they brush it uh, to one, you know, generality that, uh, they are failed states, but uh, Jay, uh, these states which we'll discuss, uh, mainly Somalia is the most failed state, technically that they call it, and um, you associate it with pri piracy. Then you have the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is a country which has seen severe violence for multiple decades. Then you have both the Sudans, Sudan and South Sudan, divided violence, ineffective gov governments and governance. So Jay, what we see is the trend of having ineffective governments and people not being provided with, they don't have access to infrastructure, they don't have access to public services, they don't have access to economic opportunities. And so these are the general categories that you can uh, you can keep the failed state in. It's increasing. <clears throat> you know, if you look back for, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years, you wouldn't you wouldn't have a list as long as we have now. Let me let me tell you what's on my list. Lebanon, Gaza, Afghanistan, Syria, Haiti, Pakistan, Democratic Republic of Congo. And that that's a euphemism because the Congo is not democratic. Uh, Somalia, as you mentioned, Sudan and South Sudan, both Myanmar. Yemen, oh, it's a really failed state. Uh, Ethiopia, as you mentioned, Chad, Guinea, Nigeria, Mali, Zimbabwe, others coming soon. A, a good number of them, if not most of them, are in the global south. And there's an increase, even over the last five years, in the number of states you would call either failed or on the way to failing. That is, states that are weak or fragile, they call it and that may very well soon be failed states. So what are the elements in terms of government? You know, a lot of these are former mm, uh, colonial states, and they rejected colonial powers. They said they would do it on their own, uh, but then their governments failed. And maybe that's because of education or corruption, um, and the result was no government. And then if you have no government, you have all those things that follow. You have no government services. You have crime, corruption, violence. And it must be terrible to, I think of myself living in, in Sudan. You know, you want to have a good government. You want to have a, a peaceful civil society. But there's no prospect of that. It just gets worse. So what is it like? Put yourself there, Rupmati. What is it like living in a failed state? It's claustrophobic and it's sinking fast. That's the situation in every failed state, Jay. And if it was only limited to within the state, then it was, uh, you know, it could have been ignored by the international community. But what really intrigues uh, us, Jay, is that the spillover effects of this failed state. When we go into a failed state and we have no basic access 
to our basic uh, services and infrastructure, there is a lot of frustration. And uh, in that, there is, when you have ineffective governances, Jay, there is um, a rebellion in the, in the people. You will uh, uh, dispose of the government uh, machinery. And what that creates, that creates space for these terrorist organizations, pirates, to come in and create for themselves an alternative to uh, for the for themselves and the people. When the people get minimum some you know profit, they go for it. So it happened in Afghanistan. Al Qaeda was thriving in Afghanistan. So uh, you have uh, Somalia, which is associated with piracy. So these uh, these spaces created by ineffective governments are the most important part of a failed state jail. And uh, that is when the international community starts giving attention. Now, J, two parts to this international intervention. When you intervene uh, head on, like we did in Afghanistan, but what about the cost of intervention, the length of the intervention, the cost of lives to the US? So you back out, correct? That creates a vacuum over there. And Al Qaeda, uh, Taliban takes over again. So, uh, that is a consistently failing state. It's in a vicious cycle that is caught up. Pakistan, the terrorists uh, are very strong. They uh, they control the um, resources and the army has formed an alternative to the political government. We have discussed it in our program on Pakistan. So uh, Pakistan has got so many problems, issues, which uh, don't allow a stable government to exist. And Jay, for any... Uh, any country to be robust, you have to have um, implementation of um, uniform economic policies backed by a stable, effective government. This is the magic formula for all. And so if you, if you take a failed state, they lack in one of this. They lack economics or they lack politics. You know, a couple of things that we didn't really talk about as elements of a failed state. Number one is... Um, Aside from personal security, there's um, uh, med medical care. Yeah. There is no medical care in a failed state. So you get sick, that's it. Uh, secondly, and maybe this is even closer to home, is the food. It's really a hassle getting food. So you stand a good chance of, of dying from hunger or disease in a failed state. That's, that's a terrible life. And everybody in a failed state is you know, subjected to those risks. The only people who are not subjected to those risks are the ones who are benefiting by corruption, which is um, you know sort of an outrage for everybody else. So yeah, I mean, so what do you? How did this happen? I think in, in a lot of places it happened because of colonial powers taking advantage and then and then leaving, abandoning, or being thrown out. And then what was left was, was uh, you know, a society that was unable to organize itself and create a government and manage itself. And there's a lot of places in the world like that. And then, you know, you say, well, OK, the, the Western world, the global north, if you will, um, knows this has happened. It's a humanitarian crisis. It tears your heart out in country after country. So as in the case of Afghanistan, as you mentioned, you know, we tried. I, I suppose you could say the Russians tried before us, but their mission was different. <clears throat> they were just trying to take over. Um, we were trying to help, and we were trying to prevent, you know, violence and attacks on the West. So <clears throat> what you know what happens is we get in there, then we get out again, as you said, and then the failure is worse. It's a spiral down, and the question. This is a hard one. How do you, uh, you know, re rebuild a state that has failed? How do you stop a state that is failing from failing? <clears throat> we don't have a system. You know, it becomes uh, political or geopolitical, many considerations, and none of them are necessarily to, to save the failed state. They are usually for other reasons that are less pure. And so in a perfect world, Rupmati, in a world where the United Nations is still the United Nations as it was, how do we rebuild? How do we prevent failed states from failing? Jade, big question, difficult question, but you're so right on this question. Because uh, 
Jay, when you mentioned that colonial uh, aftermath, what happens in these countries, they are not built to absorb democracy in the way that the Western world imagines democracy to be. A judiciary, a sense of justice, legality, federal governments, bureau, bureaucracy, a central government. They, 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 you know, Afghanistan we speak about, they are more comfortable with their tribal warlord system rather than a federal system. So they bounce back to that uh, uh, justice system where you know you do something and they shoot you rather than you go to hire an attorney and go to the judge and appeal. Uh, so you know there's an imbalance in absorption of values, democratic values, and that's what creates the imbalanced state. And so failed state, when we categorize it on the basis of politics, and when we say that uh, our democratic setups have not been put up in these countries, uh, we, we limit the notion of a failed state. We actually categorize, like you said, when they don't have basic services, you're feeling claustrophobic in a, a failed state. That is when we realize that when it's harming human life, that is the point when we say it's a failed state. And uh, coming to the point that, Jay, what do we do about the state failing, the United Nations coming to uh, build or, you know, you, you see in all the uh, failed states or in points of conflict, you have the United Nations. But we know that the United Nations offices are not neutral. The UNRWA was the one who was encouraging indoctrination of Palestine children against Israel. So uh, that kind of a setup is definitely not needed in uh, areas. When they come for post-conflict rather than conflict resolution during the civil war, you, you see the sole international organization of the world falls short in many, many places. And it, need, it needs reform. The United Nations needs urgent reform in its uh, outlook, Jay. So, uh, and uh, Jay, when a country, like the hegemon of the country, like Russia and uh, um, America have gone into Afghanistan, the costs come in of intervention. And till it's beneficial to the country, you will do it. But when it costs you life, you will come out, but naturally. Why will you harm yourself for a failed state or failing state? It is just to protect your borders and another terrorist organization should not take seed or destroy the current terrorist organization is the aim. Aim finished, mission completed. Fair enough. But Jay, uh, there are nations who, uh, you know, who will want uh, aid and it will go into corruption. So uh, uh, example I'll give you of the IMF, which is a part of the United Nations, the financial part of the United Nations. They, they, they come for aid, like the 2001 Argentine crisis. They gave loan to the uh, government. Like their concept is if they pump in money, they will the governments will have stable pockets and they will be able to get the people to support the government. But what happens with this is, Jay, debt restructuring happens and you fall into a debt trap. The country's fiscal deficit in repaying the loan amount makes the country spiral into more inflation and more debt. And that is known as a debt trap. China does that with the Belt Road. Yeah. But let me let me um, offer you some thoughts based on this discussion so far. It seems to me that um, if geopolitical considerations and manipulations uh, have created failed states or enhanced them, uh, exacerbated them over the years, uh, and the UN hasn't been able to re really do anything about it, really nothing. I'm thinking of Rwanda, uh, Hotel Rwanda, the movie. It, it showed you how the UN ran away. They ran away. Even though the people who were killing each other were ordinary civilians, they could have stopped that, but they ran away and leaving it to be a failed state. Some people feel that even today, Rwanda is a failed state. So, but you know what I'm thinking is that we need we need a better UN, reformed UN, just as you said. But I think beyond that, we need. Are you ready? Are you sitting down? We need a world government. We need a world government that will make these moral choices and enforce them. And I don't think you'd have to do it everywhere all the time. Just do it a few times until people get the idea that this revised UN, this world government, is capable 
um, of, 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 of governing the world. Um, and then you don't have this and everybody follows the rules and failed states don't fail uh, or they're resurrected in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a constructive way. I mean, you know, very likely that Ukraine may become a failed state. Um, I mean, we we have this happening all around us, and we are oblivious. That's why the, the choice of this subject for our show today is so important, because we haven't paid attention. The, U, the U.S. hasn't paid attention. Now, isolationism is the exact wrong way to go. Uh, Russia hasn't paid attention. It, it, it tends to destroy states by manipulating them and um, taking advantage of them. The same with China. Those debt traps do not help anybody but China. Um, so, you know, we really have a, a global problem here that is getting worse all the time. And the existence of failed states is a, a threat to all states. Um, the, the resurrection of failed states is a benefit to all states. And what we have here is a, an increase in failed states. And the failed states are more deadly, more destructive than they've ever been. They lead to situations like in Sudan where they have warring factions, essentially a perpetual civil war. Uh, how do you come out of that? One thing you do, and this is very interesting, we have to include this in our discussion. One thing you do is you get out of town you know, you leave the failed state because you can't eat there because it's too violent there. Like in Haiti with the gangs, you know, how can you live in a world that's ruled by gangs? And so many other places in Latin America where, you know, the gangs threaten you and you, you can't live, you can't raise your children, you can't go to school, you can't get a job because of these, you know, lawless organizations all around you. So you try to leave. You try to cross the southern border of the United States to get away from it, seeking sanctuary. You try to cross the Mediterranean and go into a relatively peaceful society in, in Europe to get away from it. And yet mm -hmm. now there's resistance to all of that. So you have failed states where people leave so they can survive. And then you have civil societies that are much better, but are now resisting and denying access to the people who are trying to get there from the failed states. My mm. goodness gracious, Rupmati, what are we going to do? It's really become a problem, is it? Serious, <laughs> serious problem. They come with the migration. Migration is such a uh, technical problem, Jay, and people don't uh, want, people have lost tolerance because you're clubbing in two civilizations together and asking them to live together and, you know, share resources and uh, Jay, why are the Western country? Why the Western countries were prospering? Because you had a limited population, and you could take care of the populations well. Now, in the same resources, if your population increases, there is going to be a decrease in the uh, amount of resources available to the native population. Like we discussed, that healthcare was uh, uh, available to a UK citizen within one month or weeks. Now it takes six months for an appointment. So that's the difference that it makes. Your basic services are hampered because you are giving an empathetic, uh, empathetic entry to another person from a failed state. So that's a all new different uh, uh, circle of problems that will come in. Jay. In Africa, or I suppose this exists elsewhere. Also, you have um, medical emergencies. Uh, you have uh, all kinds of viruses that can, be, you know, be generated in a failed state. Ah and that can kill a, a great number of people. And what happens is the governments uh, of, of the Western world, the global North, may or may not uh, try to stop that, but the NGOs come because they see it as a humanitarian crisis. And so they send their doctors and nurses and supplies into the failed state. But that is so superficial. The best they can hope for uh, is to ameliorate the, you know, the the, the epidemic, the pandemic, um, and that's the best, but they never get to the question of the root causes of all of that. They never get to the question of preventing the next outbreak. So I find the NGO effort is interesting, commendable in some ways, but it's not a solution. 
Yeah, Jay, the, uh, the United Nations is the biggest NGO like this, like what you said. Uh, they never come for the resolution of the problem. They come for the post-conflict um, uh, solution because that gives them money. You remember the food for uh, gas uh, scandal of uh, Kofi Annan and his son-in-law? So this kind of, uh, it benefits that. A resolution of the problem will not benefit them. It, they could have got a community of states and stopped the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine at that point when it was at its infancy. But they allow it to move in. When you categorize Hamas as a terrorist organization in your first resolution, you set a precedent to what happens next. When you refuse and you have a denial mode, you give more, uh, what do you say, you give more uh, power to the terrorist organizations to victimize themselves when they themselves are the oppressors. So, Jay, we have a very flawed supervising system in our international politics. And that is where why we have uh, more than 50 uh, failed states and on the verge of failing more. Uh, this list doesn't um, uh, stop because you don't have a good set of rules that the nations need to follow. Well, we, we don't have a, we need a global government. We need a global government. Well, not everybody will go off and do their own thing or do things that are counterproductive to, to others. We need a government that will get together and actually mm -hmm. make mm, consistent, uh, uniform rules and then enforce them. It's not yeah. hard. It would not have been hard for the UN to stop the genocide in Rwanda. It would not have been hard for the UN um, to stop what was going on in Haiti. Instead, uh, they organized some soldiers from Kenya, I think it was, to go over there. Clearly mm -hmm. not qualified to stop the gangs. And so what we have is people pawn it off, just as you say. They don't really want to solve the problem. They, they pawn it off on someone else. And okay. so the system isn't working. By the way, I, I just thinking, you know, that this is a treasure trove of material for us to cover. There are so many countries that we should cover one by one because all their stories are different. They're all threatening. They're all render, tear your heart out, but they're all different. And so, Rupmati, we ought to we ought to cover them one by one and and keep covering them because this is a global problem of major magnitude. And that's and that's what I want to ask you last. Um, mm -hmm. So, if I give you a country, I don't remember how long the list was that I read, but let's say there are twenty countries on the failed state list. There's probably more than that, twenty five, whatever, um, and others soon to fail. What will that look like if this is the, the Charles Dickens ghost of Christmas future question? Um, what will that look like in five or 10 years? Instead of having 20 or 25 failed states, suppose we have 50 failed states. Suppose <laughs> we have manipulations and civil wars and violence and, and death, death of the, those people and attempts to cross you know, uh, uh, waters uh, bodies of water to escape, but unsuccessful. What what is going to happen to the world? It's not like we're exempt here in the U.S. from the problems that exist south of the border. You and I have talked about that before. Uh, and the same thing in Europe. It's not like they can just you know close the door. It is not that simple. The more failed states there are, the more threats they are to to the global north. Your thoughts about that? Am I right about that? Super right about this linkage, what you speak about, Jay. That any problem in the South will have its effect uh, consequently on the North. Terrorism, migration, uh, you know, you'll have uh, crime, corruption, uh, pollution, environmental hazards, economic resources. Uh, you name it and you have it. Demographic problems, uh, cultural problems, social, uh, social tensions. All this, it's just going to, you know, it's it's a bubble which is coming. Political changes that are going to take place after, you know, we had more than around 24 elections last in this, within this year, all over the world. And so there's, there have been a lot of political changes. And Jay, we know if it's a flawed political democ uh, system that comes in, it has got uh, consequential effects on the entire ruckus of things, Jay. And if it's uh, they 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 really uh, don't have a very uh, balanced uh, 
economic uh, what political policy it has got so many side effects and which will you know give you a circle which you cannot get out of and that has happened in so many uh, nation states jay and it happens uh, over such a long period and nobody can do anything about it like if you take the case of lebanon in 1929 they had a problem when their currency was around 2 uh, 5000 times uh, inflation they had it continued you had the um, french and the british which came in they uh, they set up the government you know you had the christian and the muslim uh, majority states you had the taif agreement which was set up and then uh, lebanon converted itself into like it was termed as the switzerland of middle east they started uh, calling when once the taif agreement came in they showed that they had a stable government and they started offering interest on your dollars so the dollar started pouring in from the middle east and that's how they uh, stabilized their economy they made it prosper you know it was like a bubble right they started offering a 10% return on your investment so that was the highest in the world the world bank termed it as the national ponzi scheme and j what happened then in 2019 when uh, there there was a this uh, uh, rumor that the fiscal deficit is increasing all the dollars vanished and what happens the economic crunch is done uh, a economy which is thriving on tourism on economic remittances uh, remittances from your citizens abroad now faces a very tight economy pandemic hits so they don't have money for even uh, you know uh, facing the pandemic and third is when the russia ukraine war happens because lebanon depends completely on russia and ukraine for oil and gas and the beirut explosion which affects 60% of a country uh, of that country's imports so three things which have happened externally and have have caused a economic downfall which the world bank terms as the third most um, horrible uh, economic uh, uh, um, occurrence after the 1926 chilean economic crisis and the 1931 spanish civil war uh, economic downturn so j imagine we are living in this uh, way where we are seeing the state fail and that is the reason why lebanon doesn't come in for a full fledged war against israel it doesn't have the resources it just doesn't have it so it's failed economically we a couple of week, uh, weeks back we saw people breaking in the glasses of uh, the banks to get their money back so they are in a dire situation it's going to get desperate and uh, we can see it observe it on your television that there's a failed state happening in front of us who's coming to help nobody you know there i saw a very interesting story about the changes in america america now where we used to have an aspirational society where you wanted to do better you wanted your children to do better you wanted the people around you to do better you wanted the country to do better now it's a it's a it's a society of desperation which trump has had a lot of effect on he's created that for us anyway i wanted to ask you as a as a last point of discussion about the us just uh, i don't have to remind you that uh, people no longer respect the supreme court and that means they question all court rulings because the supreme court is on the top of, on corruption and on bad decisions one kind or another um they don't believe in congress so we're going to have another shutdown pretty soon it's likely and we had a number of them during the republican years um we may have more now um we have all kinds of cheating going on um on voting and on state legislators that are that are dominated by republicans who don't follow the rule of law um we have people with guns who are ready to pull the trigger on what would amount to much greater violence political violence all over the country we have violence everywhere you know i wonder and people say and in my reading on failed states people ask on the web is is the united states going to be a failed state and the answer is always no 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 the united states is the most powerful most successful best economy best government in the world they always say that it reminds me of what my mother said when i was a kid um but query uh yeah. it's changed uh, do you think the united states uh, stands a chance of becoming a 
a failed state? <laughs> Should I say no, no, no? I really like the UN as the US as the hegemon of the system. I mm -hmm. really do. But uh, Jay, what will happen uh, in this? God forbid that if he wins, he comes with a uh, um, oligarchic problem. He will give the contracts to those uh, he favors, and that is where our problem lies. That it will bring you know a big part of a robust. Uh, uh, state is that there has to be uniform economic implementation, uh, policy implementation, like the patent which was put in 1790. If uh, it was not implemented uniformly and if uh, Jefferson had decided that whoever favors him will get the pet patent, uh, it would not have worked, isn't it? It was a uniform thing. You invent, you go, you follow a procedure and you get. Now, if Trump comes into power, he will be the one who will say, Gerard Krishna's uh, uh, people will get this contract and my uh, uh, favored people will get this contract and that will set up a spiral which we cannot stop. And uh, Jay, it's so likely that like we see in the case of Lebanon from 2019 to 2020, it's failed completely. So uh, his his policies are very, very hard and uh, Jay, they're very vague. I, I, we have spoken about it. He's like a chameleon. He changes color. He says everything without saying every, anything. He He's dramatic to the core. But at the end of it, the just, just the core uh, idea is zero. There is nothing what he wants to call. He just does selfish deeds. There is nothing for the welfare of the uh, state. But it seems like it's for the welfare of the state. It's showmanship that is at its best, Jay. <laughs> Yes, it is. Well, mm -hmm. we're out of time, Rupmati, but I want to ask you to uh, I want to ask you to be the Secretary of State for a moment. <laughs> I always I always yeah. like making you the Secretary of State. I think you'd be a great Secretary of State. You would be addressing this this whole thing about failed states and what the United States, um, you know, as the potentially, uh, hopefully, the city on the hill, uh, what it would do to deal with this this increasing failure of failed states. So can you answer that? What would you do as Secretary of State? Not of Trump's, <laughs> not of Trump's. <laughs> but yes, uh, for sure, Jay, uh, as Secretary of State, you uh, would want to bring out a coalition of states in almost all parts, because when we see that something which uh, uh, collaborated in Afghanistan could come and blow up the 9-11 to uh, towers, we know that we need to have a good supervision. So setting up a coalition, like you said, working towards a base world government uh, and keeping the uh, uh, UN confined to NGO duties and having a political coalition of states which would act as a buffer for all these failed states. We have, uh, you know, nitty gritties of this world government that you talk, G7 thinking of aid, G20 thinking of uh, uh, political uh, directions, but none of them have the implementation. The implementation of policies uh, of a world government is the most crucial part which we can have to prevent the failure of a state. So setting up that implementing uh, policy, that infrastructure would be the first priority. Okay. All right. Well, you're appointed then. It's clear. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Rupmati. It's miles to go before we sleep. There are so many issues in so many places, and they all they all have implications elsewhere. They are all geopolitically relevant, every single one. Thank you so much, Rupmati Kandakar, our uh, geopolitical strategist. Uh, we'll see you next week. Aloha. Aloha, Jay. Thank you very much.